أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع لذنوبنا وتبيب نفوسنا عبا القاسم محمد والصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته التيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين وفقنا الله وإياكم بعلم وعمل صالح إن شاء الله بذكر الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هل يستوي الذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Respected elders, brothers, sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. These are of course the nights of Muharram, the nights in which we have, or we usually every year congregate and get together to commemorate and to lament on the tragedy that befell on the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salam, but specifically Imam al Hussein salawatullahi wa salam alayhim. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that despite the circumstances that we are in, the movement of the Aza of Abi Abdullah alayhi salam has not ceased, it has not stopped. And not only that, but we are a part of that movement. And we will continue to be a part of that movement until the day of judgment or until the final days of our lives at least. And despite the current circumstances, we are able to mourn and lament and we are able to, for example, perform the Aza of Imam alayhi salam from our homes. And for that tawfiq that has been given to us, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ayah that I've just read of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks a very rhetorical question. And that question is when you have two individuals, one who is considered to be a person of knowledge, and the other who has no knowledge, then do you consider these two individuals to be equal? Would you say that the one who has knowledge and the one who does not have knowledge are both equal? Of course not. The reason why that is is because a person who has knowledge is able to guide himself in life. Whenever he comes across certain problems, whenever he comes across certain scenarios, he's in trouble, for example, he's able to use his knowledge and get him outside of that trouble. Knowledge, for example, is a path upon which a person can seek success. A person can reach his goals and his purposes, his aims. Knowledge is that which brings a person closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you find that there is a heavy emphasis in the Holy Quran, not only within the Holy Quran, but within the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt as well. That a person, a Muslim in general, but more specific, a person who is considered to be the followers of the Ahl al-Bayt alayhim as salam should try and gain knowledge as much as possible. As you know, there are many narrations regarding this, that a person should seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. That a person, for example, should yearn to seek knowledge even if it means that he should travel long distances all the way to the lands of China. If that is the case, a person should try and extract knowledge from wherever he can. And so you have all of these different profound ahadith, which emphasizes the importance of seeking knowledge. And what knowledge does is, it allows a person to guide himself in life. 
A person may come across many situations in life that may deter him away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But a person who has knowledge is able to safeguard himself. He is able to safeguard his deen. He is able to safeguard his iman. And a person who does do that or a person when he safeguards himself is able to develop a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is able to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that is not imaginable even by the human mind. That is something that Islam endorses. Imagine a person who walks into a forest in the darkest of nights. He has no tools. He has no equipments. He has no way to traverse from one end of the forest to the other. You know for a fact that this person will injure himself. He will, for example, hurt himself. He will be attacked by the animals or by the insects that are around him. But when a person enters a forest with a guide, with a lamp, with a torch, with a phone, for example, then he is able to guide himself and deter from all of the troubles that exist within that forest. And that's exactly what knowledge does for us. And hence, and I'm sure many of you have heard different majalis, many of you have read many different chapters of different books of how a person should go about, make an effort in gaining knowledge. And the simple, and there is of course a very simple formula. And that formula is that if a person was to invest in his religion, when you give your time learning about the religion of Islam, learning about the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt, when you give your wealth, for example, learning about the religion of the Ahlul Bayt, learning about the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, the more dedicated you are in preserving that in your life. When you come across certain individuals who, for example, sway from one path to the other, when you find, for example, a simple example that I can give is with regards to the, the polemical discussions that we have amongst the Shia and the Sunnah, for example, or from between the Muslims and the non-Muslims, amongst them the new atheists. You find, for example, when a person asks a question, and when that question seems as a difficult question, you find that when a person is not invested in the religion of Islam, when he has not cared about sharing or gaining knowledge about the religion of Islam, his faith will shake and it will be easy for him to deter and to move away from the religion of Islam. Whereas a person who is invested, a person who has studied, a person who is dedicated in learning about the knowledge of the A'imma will try and find answers, will try and find um, We'll try and find answers and solutions to many of the shubahat, many of the different misunderstandings that exist in the world, especially in this day and age. Especially the amount of information that we have access to. Especially the amount of information that is there available on social media. And therefore, in tonight's lecture, or in today's discussion, I want to break the discussion into three areas, inshallah. The first area, I want to look into the relationship between al and the Ahl al-Bayt alayhim as -salam. And what is the relationship between these two? Number two, having understood the relationship between knowledge and the Ahl al-Bayt alayhim as -salam, can the Ahl al-Bayt forget? It's a theological discussion, a very interesting question that is often raised by people. Can the Ahl al-Bayt forget the way you and I forget? And the third area of my discussion, inshallah, for today's presentation is... What are the responsibilities when a person gains knowledge or when a person reaches that level of knowledge as per the understanding of Imam Bakir alayhi salam, as per the guidance of the Imam alayhi salam. So inshallah, these three areas, let's cover them one after the other. As far as the first discussion is concerned, there is a magnificent relationship between the Ahl al-Bayt and knowledge. That when you refer to the books of the Sunnah as well as the Shia, you find that not only have the Ahl al-Bayt come forward and endorsed and encouraged their followers to gain knowledge as per the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, but you find that they were considered to be the foremost in knowledge. In fact, any virtuous quality that you can think of, you find that the Ahl al-Bayt were the foremost in that particular Quality. When it comes to knowledge, they were considered to be the alam of their time, the most knowledgeable of their time. When you refer to their bravery, they were considered to be the most bravest of their time. 
when you consider the be when you consider the virtues of having basira foresightedness of how they can move their communities forward what areas their people or their companions should focus on they had basira to the highest degree to the highest levels when you speak about for example the quality of wisdom they had the highest level of wisdom when you speak about the qualities of purity and nobility the ahlul bayt were considered to be the most noble and the most pure of their time in fact when you refer to the different narrations of the ahlus sunnah wal jamaa and there is a tafaq there is an agreement between us and them that the ahlul bayt each and every one of them were considered to be scholars they were considered to be a'lam of their time you refer back to ali ibn abi talib salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi and the narrations are very clear that the prophet would come forward and say ana madinatul ilm wa aliyun babuha that in order to understand the depths of the religion of islam you can only do so by going through ali ibn abi talib salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi that if you were to remove ali from the equation then you will never understand the depths of the religion of islam when you come across for example another narration He says you are to me as Aaron was to Musa as Harun was to Musa except that there is no prophet after me meaning that Rasul Allah is depicting a position that Ali is on the same level as I am except that there is no prophet after except that of the quality of prophethood that I have been made a prophet and because prophethood was given to the holy prophet of Islam that distinguishment made it clear that he was far greater than Ali ibn Abi Talib but in other areas their knowledge their purity their intention everything was of the same level and this is of course mentioned in the ayah of the holy quran in mubahila when rasul allah brings alongside him ali ibn abi talib he says that he is what nafs al rasul the ayah of the holy quran says and depicts the information to us that he was on the same level as rasul allah except that the holy prophet of islam was considered to be a rasul and ali alayhi salam was not seen as a rasul he was seen as an imam a guardian of the message of rasul allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi when you come across certain narrations ibn abbas he comes forward and he testifies he says that with regards to the knowledge of ali he was the most foremost in knowledge there was no companion like that of ali ibn abi talib salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi when you look at for example different narrations each and every one of them depicting the knowledge of imam ali alayhi salam ali yun ma al haq wal haq ma ali ali yun ma al quran wal quran ma ali that he was the most foremost in knowledge in comparison to all of the companions that were there in the time of the holy prophet moving on from there you find that this knowledge was inherited by imam hasan alayhi salam it was then inherited by imam hussein salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi it was then inherited by imam as-sajjad imam al-baqir and all of the remaining imams of the ummah al-atahar each and every one of them were considered to be the foremost in knowledge you take the example of imam baqir alayhi salam a phenomenal individual you find that our discussion tonight will revolve around imam baqir alayhi salam learning from his teachings learning from the knowledge that he has left behind for us to inherit as his followers you find that the imam alayhi salam an nawawi comes forward sunni scholar famous he says muhammad al baqir was a leading member of his generation he was a skillful imam He was a jurist and a mujtahid from amongst the mujtahidin of his time. Ibn Hajar al-Haythami for example in his Sawa'iq al-Muhraka he comes forward and he uh, when he speaks about Imam Baqir alayhi salam he says that the reason why he was given the name or the title al-Baqir was because huwa yabkaru ilman baqara that he would split forth knowledge he would create a fissure and knowledge the way a fisher is created within the earth and he would make everything hidden that he would make everything manifest that which is hidden in the depths of the earth meaning what meaning that he would create he would make manifest everything that is hidden in knowledge he would bring forth information that no one had knowledge of he would for example bring forth knowledge and make it apparent in such a way 
that each and every single individual would understand that piece of knowledge. Ibn Hajar, he comes forward and he says something beautiful. He says that there are only one group of people that would not understand the knowledge of Al-Baqir alayhi salam. And who are those? There are those, they are the ones who are corrupt from inside. They are the ones who have blackened their hearts from inside. But those who are pure from inside, they would understand the knowledge of Al-Baqir alayhi salam. He says, furthermore, he goes on to say that his knowledge and his deeds and his actions were honest. His soul was pure. His morals were noble. And he would spend his days and his nights in Allah's obedience. You look at the example of Shamsuddin al Dhahabi. Shamsuddin al Dhahabi, interesting fella he was, a scholar from amongst the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. He comes forward and he says, Al Baqir, let's speak about Al Baqir. He says he was the best of, his, of the Hashimites. Hashimites. He was an outstanding merit. He had knowledge and he was righteous in nature. He says the reason why he was known as Al Baqir was because he would split open knowledge. He knew its hidden origin. He goes on to say that he was a man of righteousness, he was a man of honor. He was a man of trust. He was what? Ahlul lil khalafal. Observe the words of Shamsuddin al Dhahabi. Shamsuddin al Dhahabi comes forward and he says, Al Baqir was Ahlul lil khalafa. He was the most appropriate for the succession of Rasulullah. If Khalafa had come into the hands of Al Baqir, we would not contest it. We would not fight against it. In fact, we would submit to the fact that he is the most appropriate for that position. But then he goes on to say, he says with regards to Al-Baqir, he is the one whom Ahad al-Imam taqulu bihi, Ahad al-Imam taqulu bihi al-Imamiyya. He is considered to be one of the 12 Imams as indicated by the followers of the Ithna Ashariya. But then what's interesting with regards to Al-Dhahabi, Al-Dhahabi in his works, when he speaks about the biography of Imam Baqir salam, you can imagine, these are praises. This is a testification uh, coming forward saying that Imam Baqir salam was considered to be the most knowledgeable of his time, most worthy of Khilafah. But then elsewhere he comes forward and he says, yes, but with regards to the contemporaries of Al Baqir, there were individuals who are considered to be more, much more knowledgeable than Al Baqir salam. Like whom? He says Ibn Kathir, for example, with regards to uh, Ibn Kathir, with regards to the tafsir of the Holy Quran, he was considered to be far more knowledgeable than Al Baqir, alayhi salam. With regards to Rabi'a, Rabi'a al Ra'i, he was considered to be more, much more knowledgeable in regards to fiqh in comparison to Imam Al Baqir, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. With regards to, for example, Qutada. Uh, Qutad al-Basri, Qutad ibn Da'amat al-Basri, he was considered to be much more knowledgeable in areas of ahadith than Imam al-Baqir salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And you can see this, uh, you, you could very much appreciate the, how on the one hand he praises Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam saying that he is the one who split open knowledge. But then when it comes to these three personalities, he says no. But these three personalities, amongst many others, they're far more knowledgeable than Al-Baqir salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. There's an interesting narration. Qutad ibn Da'amat al-Basri. Very interesting narration. Let's talk about his interactions with Imam al-Baqir. Remember, Shams al-Din al-Zahabi comes forward and he says that Qutada was far more knowledgeable than Imam Baqir alayhi salam in areas of hadith. They say one day Qutada, he was from the lands of Basra. He was a faqih from the lands of Basra. He travels all the way to the city of Medina. He goes to the city of Medina. He enters Masjid al-Nabi. When he enters Masjid al-Nabi, he meets a man. This narration is narrated by whom? It's narrated by Abu Hamza Thumani, famous companion of Imam al-Sajjad as well as Imam al-Baqir. Abu Hamza Thumani narrates, he says, this man approached me, Qutada ibn Da'amat al-Basri. 
He came towards me and I knew exactly who he was. He came and he said to me, do you know, uh, do you know a sadiq sorry, do you know the father of Abi Abdullah alayhi salam, al-Bakr, referring to Imam Bakr alayhi salam. So Abu Hamza Thumali, he replies, he says, of course, uh, everyone in this town, everyone in the city knows al-Bakr, salawatullahi wa sallam alayhi. He says, where can I find him? Abu Hamza replies, he says, what is it that you need from him? So Qutada, he narrates, he says that I have certain questions. I need certain clarifications with regards to these questions. So Abu Hamza Thumali, he narrates, he says to him, he says, um, you know, do you not know the difference between Haqq and Batil? Indicating that, hold on a second, you consider yourself a faqih, a mujtahid. You consider to be amongst the high echelons of the ulama of Basra. You don't, you, you do not have the understanding or the distinct, you don't have the ability to distinguish Haqq between Batil, a Haqq from Batil. Upon which when Qutada heard this, he says to Abu Hamza Thumali, he says, listen, just let me know when you see him. When you see him, you know, let, give me news so that I can come and I can sit with him and I can meet and I can discuss with him. A few moments later, a short while later rather, the narration goes on to say that he actually met Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. The Imam alayhi salam was in Masjid al-Nabi. And as he was sitting, he was sitting in Masjid al-Nabawi and there were certain people from Khorasan who had come to meet him. And these individuals from Khorasan, they were having a Q&A session with the Imam a.s. They were asking questions with regards to Manasik al-Hajj, with regards to the A'mal that are to be performed in Hajj. They were asking questions and the Imam a.s. was answering. And of course, their Q&A session finished. They got up and they left. Qutad and Arayts, he says that as they left, a group of people came and they sat next to the Imam alayhi salam. Second session. And this was absolutely normal in the time of the Imam alayhi salam, where people would constantly come and they would sit with the Imam, just asking, firing questions towards the Imam and the Imam would answer them. So as soon as the first group left, the second group came and they sat and they began discussing with the Imam. The Imam again answering every question that they would throw uh, towards them. Towards him, alayhi salam. When Qutada narrates, he says, I sat down with the second group that sat down alongside Imam al-Bakr. The Imam alayhi salam was answering all of these questions. I sat down and I began to listen. I began to listen every single thing that they were asking him and how the Imam alayhi salam was answering back at them. When this group finished with their questions, they got up and they left. The Imam alayhi salam, then he turned towards me. And then he asked me, he said, oh, Qut- he said, oh man, who are you? Upon which Qutada, he replies, he says, Ana Qutada ibn Da'amat al-Basri. The Imam, he looks at him and he says, you are from amongst the fuqaha of Ahl al-Basra, aren't you? You are a faqih from the lands of Basra, are you not? Qutada, he replies in the affirmative, he says, indeed I am. He says, ya Qutada, way haq. He says, woe unto you. Inna Allah azza wa jalla khalaka khalqan wa ja'alahum hujajan ala khalqih. فَهُمْ أَوْتَادٌ فِي أَرْضِهِ قَوَّامٌ أَمْرِهِ نُجَبَاءَ فِي أَلْمِهِ إِسْتَفَاهُمْ قَبْلَ خَلَقَهِ أَذَلَّ عَنْ يَمِينَ أَرْشَهِ He says, Ya Qutada, woe unto you. He says, indeed, Allah has created creation. And there is a part of his creation that he has made them proofs over his earth. Ya Qutada, these individuals are the representatives of Allah. They are the pillars of creation. They are the manifestation of Allah's knowledge. They carry out Allah's orders. And Allah has chosen them before he has created them. And their names are written all on the arsh, on the throne of Allah. When Qutada heard these words, the narration, do you know what the narration says? فَسَكَتَ قُطَادَ تَوِيلًا 
He remained silent. Qutada had nothing to say to the Imam salam. He was silent. The narration goes on to say, Imam asks Qutada, he says, Ya Qutada, what's wrong? Qutada replies, he says, Wallah, in my time, I have sat with the higher echelons from amongst the ulama, different mufassireen, different muhaddithin, different mutakallimin, different, for example, fuqaha, Never has my heart trembled the way it is trembling now. The Imam alayhi salam looks at him and he says, Ya Qutada, do you know where you are? Qutada, do you know why your heart is trembling the way it is trembling? Do you know where you're sitting? Qutada is saying, tell me, where am I sitting? He says, you are sitting buyutin adhina, buyutin adhina, turfa, wa yudhka fi hasmu. يُسَبِّهُ لَهُ فِيهَا بِالْغُدُوِّ وَالْعَلْسَالِ وَالْعَصَالِ He says, Ya Qutada, you are sitting in a house that has been raised, that has been ascended by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In it, the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are mentioned. And so you find that when you come across many of these narrations, these narrations highlight that the A'imma alayhim salam, each and every one of them, were considered to be the most foremost in knowledge. Qutada, who was seen as a scholar from amongst the scholars of Basra, or even Iraq, when he sits in the presence of Al-Baqir, he was, as the narrations explain, it was like a child sitting in front of his master, like a child who is sitting in front of his teacher. This was the position of the Ahl al-Bayt, alayhim salam. Qutada, in a single sentence, his heart begins to tremble. Because he identifies and he realizes the knowledge of the Aymma alayhim salam. Shamsuddin al Dhahabi, the injustice that he's done towards the Ahl al Bayt. Why? On the one hand, he praises them, testifies of their knowledge. But on the other, he comes forward and he says, No, but there are others who are far greater than the Ahl al Bayt that are spoken of by the Ahl al Shia, al Ithna al Sharia. You find the same Imam al Baqir salawatullahi wa salam alayhi. As a phenomenal history, they say he was three years of age when he witnessed the massacre of Karbala. That Karbala took place in the year 61 after Hijrah. Imam Bakr alayhi salatu was born in 57, yeah, in the 57th year after Hijrah. He was three years of age when he saw the tragedy of Karbala. What's far more profound than this is that not only did he witness the tragedy of Karbala, a Tabari in his tarikh, a Tabari, a profound historian in his tarikh, there's an entire section in which he dedicates the accounts of Imam Bakr alayhi salam. That's beautiful. You won't find that anywhere else with regards to any other individual in the world. A Tabari, he testifies, he comes forward and he says, with regards to the knowledge of Al Bakr, I testify that his knowledge is trustworthy that he is the most truthful and he is the most knowledgeable of his time. Why? Because even though the Imam was three years of age, Tabari dedicates an entire section, trusting the source of this three-year-old in speaking about the tragedy of Karbala. A Tabari is a profound book of history. Yes, it's considered to be a very prominent book, um, Trusted even amongst the Ahl Shia, not only the Sunnah but the Ahl Shia as well. I mean, of course, we have our own reservations in regards to certain areas of that book. For example, in some areas the details are omitted, in some areas the details are unclear, in some areas, for example, the information is not precise enough. But when it comes to Karbala, the information is extensive, and all of it are given by Imam Bakr alayhi salam, despite he was three years of age. I mean, today, for example, when you go to the courts of law, yes, you fight, for example, there's a man who has been charged by the crimes of murder or theft or any of the heinous crimes that are considered to be heinous according to our conventional understanding of society. Imagine if a three-year-old is brought forth and taken to the stands of court and a three-year-old testifies and he says, I saw Fulan ibn Fulan, uh, murder, for example, this individual. Would the words of a three-year-old hold in the court of law? A three-year-old 
I mean, sometimes when a three-year-old speaks, we don't pay much attention to them. Why? Because their words don't carry much weight. Yet you find a tabari, he comes forward and he testifies. He says that even though Al-Baqir was three years of age, in Karbala, I will take his account into consideration. And so this prompts us into the next area of our discussion, which is of course a very heavy discussion in itself. The question is, can the Ahl al-Bayt alayhim as forget? I mean, let's be honest, we've got an account of Karbala from a three-year-old of what's mentioned in Tariq al-Tabari. Maybe perhaps, uh, you know, someone, someone may come forward and say, perhaps the Ahl al-Bayt alayhim as at times they can forget, at times their testimony may not be um, precise, at times, for example, they may omit certain things, they may, for example, add certain uh, spices in their words. Fundamental question is raised, can the Ahl al-Bayt alayhim as forget? And the answers are there within the Holy Qur'an. You find that the concept of forgetfulness is something that we should very much be aware of. You know, many people come forward and they ask questions to scholars. When you have a good speaker who is seen as an outstanding speaker, the question that people usually or often ask is, how did you establish such a powerful memory? When you go meet, for example, some of our fuqaha, some of our greatest teachers in the Hawzat, we ask this question, how do you develop such a profound level of knowledge? You find that the answer is there provided within the Holy Quran. That doesn't mean that what the Quran provides for us is the core reason as to why uh, we tend to forget or how a person can establish a powerful memory. But it, from a spiritual perspective, you realize that this is one of the greatest ways a person can preserve knowledge. Gaining knowledge is something that anyone can do. But the preservation of that knowledge is something that very little can do. What the Quran speaks about, what the riwayat of the Ahl al-Bayt speak about, is not just gaining knowledge, but preserving knowledge. So for example, when you turn to science, science will say, well, work out, jog for a while, you know, skip for a while, um, eat proper meals, eat food which is clean. All of this has a profound effect on your brain, your brain, which is an instrument for you to be able to understand and collect information. Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam as well as Imam Ali salawatullahi was salamu alayhi in many different narrations, in many different words explain to us that knowledge is not what is accumulated by the mind. Knowledge is nur which penetrates, which permeates the heart of the human being, which enters the heart of the human being and Allah gives it to whomever he wishes so what the Ayyama alayhim salam have done is they have created a spiritual dimension with regards to the element of ilm. Knowledge is not something physical. Knowledge is not something which is the, it's not the idea of memorizing or reading over and over again. Hassan al-Basri, when he comes to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam and he says, Ya Imam, I want to learn. The Imam says to him, Ya Hassan al-Basri, knowledge is not that you constantly read and memorize. Knowledge is that which enters the heart of, of that person by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ali alayhi salam to Kumail ibn Ziyad al a beautiful hadith. He says, Ya Kumail, understand that there are three types of people in this world. There are those who gain knowledge. There are those who teach knowledge. And then there are the riffraff of society. But before this statement, what does he say? He says, Ya Kumail, the hearts are like containers of knowledge or the minds are like containers of knowledge. But then when you look around, you find that there are many people in this world who have knowledge. You have Hufad of the Holy Quran. Many of them have graduated from many of the universities in the city of Medina. Wonderful reciters. They recite Taraweeh year in and year out. And they have, for example, thousands, hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube of how people are attracted to their recitation. Yet these are the same people who come forward and they promote the respect of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. They promote the respect of Yazid ibn Muawiyah and all of the criminals in history. So where is that knowledge? How does that 
uh, you know, the verses of the Holy Quran, how does that help them? They have profound levels of knowledge to have memorized the entire Quran. Find knowledge is that it is the nur of Allah which penetrates the heart of the human being. So when you refer to the ayat of the Holy Quran, you find that the idea of forgetfulness is caused by shaytan al-la'in al-rajim. Shaytan actively forgets or makes the human being forget. Um, that doesn't mean that he actively enters your mind and makes or erases, for example, certain pieces of information from your minds. No. What it means is that shaitan diverts the attention of the human being. So say for example, my priority right now is to focus on A, but then shaitan will allow me, will distract me, will move or sway my desires from point A to point B. That I forget about A because I am busy with B. You take the beautiful story of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. Nabi Yusuf is in the dungeons, he is in prison. When he is in prison, one of his companions that is there alongside him, he, when he is freed from the prisons, Nabi Yusuf turns to him and he says, mention my name to your Rabb, so that I am freed from these prisons. That king has forgotten about me, but I want you to act as a medium to go and remind him that I exist and I'm still in the prisons. What does the Quran say? The Quran says that when he left the prisons, فَأَنْسَاهُ shaytan فَأَنْسَاهُ shaytan And shaytan made him forget. Meaning what? Meaning that shaytan moved him from one uh, priority to a different priority. Shaytan swayed his desires that he was to forget about Nabi Yusuf altogether. This happens to us in our lives sometimes. When we have a priority that we must focus on, at times we get distracted and we forget about what we were meant to do. Another area in which shaitan can divert and make us forget is when we commit sins. When we commit sins, you find that we tend to forget. When a person adheres to taqwa, Taqwa has this magnificent effect of strengthening the aql of the human being, the memory of the human being. That's why the fuqaha, constantly they come forward and they advise. They said, if you want to develop a powerful memory, memory number one, engage in the recitation of salawat Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And this is, of course, a famous uh, statement that was uttered by Al-Marhum Ayatollah Sheikh Jawad Tabrizi. He said, you want to develop a powerful memory? Two things. Number one, salawat. Number two, engage in the memorization and the recitation of the Holy Quran. And this is in par with the ayat of the Holy Quran. وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكْ إِذَا نَسَيْتْ or إِذَا نَسِيْتْ And mention or remember your Lord if you forget. That's why amongst the sunnah of the ulama is what? Is that whenever they forget something, they always constantly engage the salawat of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, or they engage in the la'na of the a'da of the Ahl al Bayt, the enemies of the Ahl al Bayt, alayhim salam. Because this reminds them of their Lord and it pulls the shaitan away from them, it pushes the shaitan away from them so that they are able to remember what they had forgotten. When you look at the Ahl al Bayt, alayhim salam, go back to the initial question. The question was, is it possible for the Ahl al-Bayt to forget? We say absolutely not. It is not permissible. No, it is not possible for the Ahl al-Bayt to forget. Why? Because they are infallible. They are ma'asum. They are the embodiment of truth and perfection. There is no way that they can forget. With regards to this, three opinions were given amongst the ulama. They said that the reason why the Ahl al-Bayt cannot forget is because they are infallible. That means that shaitan has no effect on them whatsoever. Sheikh Nasir Makarim Shirazi, he comes forward and he says, he says it is possible for the Ahl al-Bayt to forget, but only when Allah makes them forget. If it is in the institution of tests or imtahanat or examination, then and only then can the Ahl al-Bayt forget, if Allah chooses to make them forget. But if it's with regards to shaitan, for example, affecting them, no, kalla, shaitan cannot affect the Ahl al-Bayt in any way whatsoever. 
Shaitan cannot touch the Ahl al-Bayt in any way whatsoever. This was the first opinion. The second opinion which was expounded or explained further by Allama Taba Taba'i Rahmatullah alayhi. Allama comes forward and he says that the Ahl al-Bayt cannot be affected by Shaitan in terms of their memory, in terms of forgetting because of Shaitan allowing them or making them forget. But Shaitan can harm them. Shaitan can, for example, harm them the way Nabi Ayyub was harmed by Shaitan. So physically being harmed by Shaitan is something possible even for the Ahl al-Bayt But Shaitan has no effect on the Ahl al-Bayt in regards to their Aqal. The third opinion came forward and they said, go back to the ayat of the Holy Quran. In Surah An-Nisa, verse number 64, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ The ayah comes forward and says that Allah had sent down prophets and these prophets are to be followed unconditionally. That each and every one of them are to be followed. That when a prophet comes forward and by extension the a'imma alayhim as-salam when they come forward and they decipher or they discern a ruling as part of the sharia we have no say in it whatsoever that we must obey them. That if the Imam السلام, was to come forward and say this is halal, it is halal. If they come forward and they say that this is wajib, I have no authority to question them because they are the representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how is it possible that on the one hand, the ayat of the Holy Quran explained to us by saying, that obedience to the ma'sumin, obedience to the representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether they are prophets or the imams are to be followed unconditionally, but then at the same time for them to forget as well. As in imagine if the prophet or the imam, who are the mufassir of the sharia of the religion of Islam, they expand on the nature of what's halal and haram, on the one hand, this is the responsibility they have, but on the other hand, they forget. Then how can you trust someone who forgets? You cannot trust someone who forgets. Rather, you trust someone who never forgets. And the Ahl al-Bayt have that authority. They have that position given to them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Going back to Imam Bakr alayhi salam, even though he witnessed the tragedy of Karbala, even though he witnessed the tragedy of Karbala at the age of three, you find that that knowledge, that that incident, that account was preserved in him. He preserved it because he was the embodiment of purification. It is because he was infallible and shaitan cannot affect the infallibles. Now we move on to the final area of our discussion. You find that the religion of Islam focuses greatly on the importance of gaining knowledge. But then when a person does gain knowledge, when a person does receive knowledge by the permission of Allah, you find that such individuals have a responsibility now. Imam Bakir in certain narrations, he explains to us how a person can gain knowledge. One of the most greatest ways of gaining knowledge is by asking questions. Asking questions is a fundamental, is a phenomenal way in which we can exchange ideas, in which we can, for example, develop our minds, in which we can understand the inner depths of the religion of Islam. Much more than listening to majalis, much more than reading books and volumes of books. Questioning can have or give the ability of the person to open his mind and understand the intricate natures of the religion of Islam. You find, for example, in a prophetic narration, the Holy Prophet of Islam comes forward and he says, Ilm is like a safe. We keep all our valuables in a safe, don't we? He says, Ilm is like a safe. It protects the individual. Not only that, he says the keys to that safe is by asking questions. You find that when we ask questions, that knowledge is much more preserved within us than simply listening to something, than simply, for example, reading something. And that's why when a person develops knowledge and he becomes an alim at whatever degree, he becomes a scholar at whatever degree, you don't have to be the highest ranking scholar 
in this world you could be for example a professional in certain area you find that when a person develops knowledge that which is beneficial according to the precepts of the religion of Islam the Imam comes forward and he explains he says an alimun yantafa alimun yantafa bi ilmihi afdalu min 70 alaf abid he says an alim who has developed knowledge that such that he benefits from that knowledge or others benefit from his knowledge his rank is far greater than 70,000 worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so what does that mean? It means that when this person passes away, it is much more hateful or it is much more beloved to shaitan than the passing and the death of 17 worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other narrations, what do they explain to us? Other narrations explain to us that the that the alim has a greater authority than the abid because when shaitan creates fitna and fasad within the community the alim is busy undoing its effects whereas the abid is busy in his sujood so you find that imam al-baqir comes forward and he explains to us that when a person reaches knowledge when a person gains knowledge there are certain responsibilities that he now has Number one, when you have knowledge, do not show it off. What does that mean? How can a person show off his knowledge? Where he is constantly argumentative. He constantly wants to debate. He constantly wants to bring down his opposition. No, that's not the adab of gaining knowledge. The adab of gaining knowledge is to try and decipher the truth. Today in our polemical discussions amongst the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, what do we do? We learn our arguments just to prove them wrong. At times, this can be effective. But many a times, we should develop knowledge to try and understand the truth rather than all, all constantly debating and discussing, constantly trying to prove others wrong. There is ikhlas which is involved in gaining knowledge. When a person does gain knowledge, he now has a responsibility to distract himself. To disassociate himself from the world, that he develops zuhud, that he becomes a zahid with regards to the materialism of this world. A faqih, for example, as mentioned in the riwayat, must be a zahid and he must have foresightedness. He must always yearn the akhirah, disassociate himself from this world and always must he take on and grab hold on to the message of the Ahl al-Bayt and the practices of the Ahl al-Bayt The second responsibility of knowledge is that if you see and identify yourself as one who does have knowledge, then go out and give others knowledge. Give back to the community. If you specialize not just in ahkam, not just in aqa'id, not just in akhlaq, whatever your profession is, if you are, for example, a professional in trading, for example, in the stock exchange market, in the forex market. If you're a professional in the medicine area, in the, med in the fields of medicine, or you're an accountant, or for example, you're a writer or an academic, give back to your community as much as possible. The zakat of knowledge is that you give back to the people. And you find, as the Aemma have explained, that when you give knowledge, that knowledge increases. It never depletes. It's not like wealth, where if you give from your wealth, your wealth deplenishes. Your knowledge never deplenishes. You find, for example, another responsibility of knowledge is that if you do not know the answer to something, then come forward and admit to yourself first and foremost that you do not know, but then also explain to the people that you do not know imagine if someone wants to ask you a question at times we feel embarrassed when we say i don't know but you find that this preserves our faith in fact according to the narrations of imam bakir salam, he comes forward and he guides his companions he says to his companions he says speak of what you know and when you do not know come forward and say allahu a'lam in another narration, quoting the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, indeed, Allah has said, 
Ya ayyuhal nas, O man, speak of what you know. And when you do not know, stop. Do not say anything anymore. They say Sheikh Al Mufid, Rahmatullah Alayhi, in the city of Baghdad, he would sit on a high pulpit, on a member. The member was very high. Why was it high? It was because obviously the people could hear him when he would speak and they could see him. So those who were far in the, in the far back of the masajid, listening to him, giving his lessons, they were able to see him and listen, him, listen to him. They say one day a man, whilst he was giving his lesson in the masjid of Baghdad, a man came to, towards him and he said, Ya Shaykh al-Mufid, I have a question. He said, what is your question? The man asks his question upon which Shaykh al-Mufid, in front of all of his students, Shaykh al-Mufid, who is seen as a star within our madhab, comes forward and he says, the question that you have asked, I do not know the answer to. Publicly, he confesses that he doesn't know. Shaykh al-Mufid, the man says to him, you are Shaykh al-Mufid. You are a mujtahid, a high-ranking scholar from all of the scholars that we have. And you do not know the answer to my question. Shaykh al-Mufid says, there's nothing wrong. He says, you sit on a high member. You sit on a high member. This is a representation of your knowledge and you do not know the answer to my question. Shaykh al-Mufid said, if you were to create a member, that... Uh, if you were to create a member that resonates my ignorance, that shows my ignorance, then that member will go even to the highest of the heavens. You find that Shaykh al-Mufid, even the great, the great scholar that he was, never felt ashamed to identify his ignorance. Never felt ashamed to come forward and say, I don't know, when he never had answers to those particular questions. So this is a responsibility of knowledge as depicted by Imam al-Baqir. Furthermore, the Imam alayhi salam explains to us that it is important that we should constantly go back to the Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam. And the Imam alayhi salam establishes the Madaris of Qum. He establishes the Madaris of Khorasan. He establishes the Madaris of Rai. He establishes the Madaris of, for example, Medina. He establishes the Madrasa of Kufa. He establishes all of these different Madaras, opening the floodgates of knowledge, preserving the message of the Ahl al-Bayt. And after defending and after preserving the message of Rasulullah, you find that the Imam salam defends his message, preserves his message by constantly telling his members, telling his companions, explaining to his companions, the importance of preserving the tragedy of Karbala in particular. You find that the Imam alayhi salam would come forward and he would encourage his companions to cry and to lament for Abi Abdullah alayhi salam. To create an emotional bond with the tragedy of Ashura. He would come forward and he would encourage his companions to go for the ziyara of Abi Abdullah alayhi salam. He would encourage his companions to, for example, recite masaib and poetry for Abi Abdullah alayhi salam. That despite him being such a profound scholar of his time and infallible, he made it his duty to preserve the tragedy of Karbala, something that we have inherited today something that we will carry on performing and acting on until the day of judgment. You find that this was something in common with the Ahl al-Bayt His son As-Sadiq would preserve the message of Ashura, his son Al-Qadim, and as well as Imam al-Ridha They say that one day when Rayyan ibn al-Shabib he enters the presence of Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam. Imam is seen crying and lamenting. The Imam cries and cries and sheds tears and he says to Rayyan, he says, Yabn al-Shabib, Yabn al-Shabib. Wallah, my father was never seen laughing or smiling in the days of Muharram. He says, Yabn al-Shabib, the month of Muharram is the month in which the people of Jahiliyyah 
would refrain from fighting and killing one another. But this Ummah, the Ummah of Rasulullah, they did not acknowledge the sanctity of the month of Muharram, nor did they acknowledge the sanctity of the family of Rasulullah. They butchered they butchered Ya Ibn Shabib, they butchered my family. If you are to cry, then cry on my grandfather Abi Abdullah. He was slain and slaughtered the way, the way a sheep is slaughtered. They slaughtered 17 members of his family. When you bring your minds, when you take your minds towards Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, they say one day, Mansur al-Dawani ki orders the house of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam to be burnt. They say the soldiers, they came towards the house of the Imam. They placed planks of wood alongside his door. Then they began to burn these woods. This wood, when it caught fire, it began to burn the houses of the Imam alayhi salam. They say the Imam came out of his house in his shirt and his trousers and began putting out the fire began extinguishing the fire. <laughs> the next day, the Imam was seen sitting on the floor, crying and weeping. His companions, they came towards him and they said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, why are you presenting such levels of grief and sorrow? This isn't something new. This isn't something new that the Bani Abbas, they come towards you and they commit crimes against you. Why do you cry in this way? The Imam alayhi salam replies, he says, Sahih, but when I put out the fire last night, I saw the women of my house and the children of my house. They were moving away from one rock to another. They were trying to escape the heat of the fire. When I saw them, I saw, and I, it reminded me of how uh, the women and the children began to move from one tent to another, escaping the heat of the fire on the day of Ashura. How they began, uh, how they began moving from one position to another, from one place to another, and how the enemies began chasing them. My brothers and sisters, these are the days Az-Zahra was not distant from what happened in Karbala. She was there. She witnessed her ruh was there. She witnessed the thirst of the children. She witnessed the slaughter of the family of Abi Abdullah. She witnessed the dishonor of the bodies and the dishonor of the heads and how their heads were separated from their bodies. She she was there alongside Abi Abdullah the whole way. Now she is here with us. She cries with us, so shed tears in honor of Abi Abdullah. They say that when the battle, when the tragedy of Karbala was finished, when it ended, Umar ibn San carried the head of Abi Abdullah to Ibn Ziyad. But Khuwaili, Khuwaili offered to take the head to Ibn Ziyad. When he entered the streets of Kufa, he went directly to the castle of Ibn Ziyad. But the gates, the gates of the castles were closed. So he went home. When he went home, there was a smile in his face and he said to his wife, he said, I have come home with gold. This is the head of Abi Abdullah. When his wife saw the head of Abi Abdullah, she said, why had, why had people bring home gold and silver? You've come home with the head of Abi Abdullah. You've come home with the head of the grandson of Rasulullah. When she left the house, she saw the head of Abi Abdullah on top of the spears uh, and she saw a light that came from it. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon Sayya'lamu alladheena zalamu ayya munkalabin yankalibun If I can request the Surah Al-Fatiha for all our marhumin inshaAllah Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim